Hi and welcome. This time around I thought I'd address another problem that I think haunts most machinists, if not all machinists, and that is breaking a tap, especially small ones, and especially if you're trying to power tap. It's, it's a problem and a fear that we all have because it's so easy to do. And I have a solution that might work, I think it's going to, uh, for non-ferrous metals that would be copper, brass, bronze, uh, aluminum, all of those steel, all of those materials, as well as even some stainless steels. And uh, it's a solution for removing a broken tap with it once you've already tried everything else. So I just broke that tap off. Yep, and it was easy as pie to do. I actually was worried that uh, this tap was too thick. And I'm gonna take this little piece of a tap right here. The other part of the tap is somewhere behind my toolkit over there since it flew off. And we're gonna try and dissolve this chemically. Again, this only works for non-ferrous materials, although I hear stainless steel also works. Maybe we'll try actually putting a tap in and breaking off a piece of material after. But first, we're gonna see how well we can dissolve this little piece of material here. Our solution to dissolve that tiny tap is involving a chemical known as potash alum or potassium aluminum sulfate. Now, alum is readily available. You need to get the potassium alum version. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of alum. Uh, potassium alum and ammonium alum seem to work the best. Uh, other alums may not work at all because the alum part is the aluminum attachment to the sulfate with some something like aluminum. It doesn't even have to be aluminum. There are other variations. Uh, and the ion on, anion on the front, uh, this is potassium, can be other things. And so this particular one is easy to come by and work, but make sure you get the right one. I guess that's the whole point of that, rather than confusing you with the chemistry. The amount of alum you can dissolve in water uh, they're showing it per 100 grams of water. Now that may be confusing because who wants to weigh out water? Well, it turns out that the whole density scheme in the metric unit system is based on the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter. So 100 grams of water is 100 milliliters, really easy to measure out. So 100 milliliters of water dissolves five grams or six grams at about zero degrees Celsius, which is freezing, eight and a half at 10, 12 at 20. Now we're starting to get around room temperature. That's like 60 some degrees, 25 at 40. 37 approximately at 50, 58 at 60, 94 at 70 degrees Celsius. We're, we're getting pretty hot now. That's something like 150, 160, somewhere in there. I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. 195 grams at 80 Celsius. 100 Celsius is the boiling point of water or 212 Fahrenheit for uh, us people stuck in uh, the United States here. The reason I even bring this up, you're going, why is he listing me the solubility of some chemical? Why do I care? Well, it takes a certain amount of this potassium aluminum sulfate to dissolve uh, a certain amount of iron. So based on your little sample here, and I've got this tiny little piece of tap, and I think I'm okay in choosing a tiny little piece of tap because usually when the taps break, it's not much, and it's usually a small tap, not a big tap. Usually big taps you can get out. Small taps can be a real nightmare because uh, you can't get anything down the hole without damaging the hole. So we're going to dissolve that piece. That's probably only a few grams. Uh, but the reason is you need to know how much to dissolve. Now, I did the calculations on this. You're probably not going to care. Um, I don't even know if I got it completely right. I, I was, I was going to be a chemistry major, but I switched to engineering later on in my career. So uh, chemistry is not my strong point. I haven't even had a chemistry class in, geez Louise, 34 five years or so. So I'm not 100% certain I got this right, but potassium aluminum sulfate is this alum powder. Um, it's normally attached to 12 uh, water, which makes it a hydrate, but I'm going to ignore that for this reaction here because it just needs 10 uh, water molecules and eight iron molecules to yield the products that I'm thinking it generates. Uh, the the iron sulfate is very likely accurate because I've looked that up. The potassium hydroxide, I'm not certain about, but it was left over and I'm thinking that's where it goes. Uh, the aluminum oxide is also was listed in a couple reaction explanations. So I'm pretty sure that's correct. And that's why this is left over. And I'm pretty sure that would form potassium hydroxide and eight hydrogen. So we should see bubbles out of this. Uh, this is my guess, not 100% certain. Based on the quantities of reactants though, uh, you can convert that to masses, and long story short, you probably don't care about the math. It takes about four and a quarter grams of potassium sulfate per one gram of iron. 
And so that's an important thing, and that's why I wanted that solubility by temperature, which basically means the warmer the water up to a point, the more potassium sulfate, aluminum sulfate, we can dissolve in it, which means the more is available to react with iron and dissolve our part. And that's what we're looking for here. Uh, on top of that, uh, as you heat the liquid, this reaction speeds up the warmer it gets. And that's true with many reactions, probably even the majority, don't quote me on that, but most reactions speed up as you add energy in the form of heat to the reaction. There are some that don't, they'll actually slow down, but those I think are very few and far between. Uh, so, so we're gonna heat some water, probably up to around 150 Fahrenheit, 160 Fahrenheit. And we're gonna dissolve a bunch of alum in it and see how long it takes to dissolve this little bit of tap. We're gonna start with the easiest solution. I've got a hot plate over here that's on the right here. And these are uh, magnetic stirs you can put in the hot plate and they'll spin the liquid around to make sure it keeps moving. That's one thing that'll speed up this uh, dissolving time uh, is to make sure the solution constantly flows over the part. So we're gonna start with something easy like this little bit of uh, tap here that I broke off and see how long it takes to dissolve. Then, you know, maybe we'll get adventurous and we'll break a tap off inside a piece of material where the liquid can't flow over it as easily and constantly replace the reacted chemicals. What you'll get is a gradient of concentrations with the lowest concentration of potassium sulfate actually at the part you want to dissolve because it's already reacted, getting to more and more potassium sulfate in areas where it can't react. So if you constantly swish the solution around, you mix that up and you get rid of that gradient and the reaction happens faster. So let's uh, get to dissolving some potassium aluminum sulfate and see what happens. So unfortunately this hot plate, the lowest temperature it goes is 150 Celsius which I'm guessing is around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It goes up to 1,000 Fahrenheit. Um, so the lowest temperature is way too hot. That's way over the boiling point of water. Don't really want that. Of course, as water boils, it pulls heat out. So I don't know what the steady state temperature is for you know a mass of water put on pot. It's gonna be lower than the bottom temperature because you'll be constantly removing heat from it. And I think you'll probably remove it faster than can add it. Don't know for a fact. Uh, that's why they just have numbers on the dial rather than a temperature. Some of these, uh, instead of having just numbers on the side, uh, would have a temperature, and that's because they've got a feedback loop, they've got a temperature sensor in the plate, which this does not have, and the temperature sensor on the plate servos the amount of current going to the heating element to control it at the temperature you want. Uh, the other knob on here is the stir, which will spin a magnetic stir, which is one of these guys. And uh, so what I've done is I've lowered the voltage to 80, which unfortunately will also slow the stirring speed, but nothing I can do about that. Uh, I'm trying to get this around 150 Fahrenheit. Uh, we're, a bit, we're a bit hot over that. Although as the water heats up, it might, uh, it might improve that. We're gonna go down a little bit more here. See what happens. In the meantime, gotta go heat up some water, dissolve some alum. Uh, this little tiny piece in here which isn't such a small piece of an 832 tap. It's actually an 840 tap. It's a really weird size. Um, that piece weighs less than a gram. So uh, even, well, less than a gram means I need less than four grams of alum to dissolve it. So we're gonna, we're gonna put a bunch more than that because this beaker is so big enough here that uh, the bottom of the scale here is 200 milliliters. So we're gonna do 200 milliliters worth and see what we get. All right, so I preheated the water a little bit in the microwave. I'm gonna turn the stirrer up to max until all the alum dissolves. So it looks like uh, the temperature is just about right, 150 for the water. Boy, did I luck out when I preheated that. So I put about 60 grams of alum in here. By the way, if you're wondering about alum, Alum is one of the ingredients used in pickling salts to make pickles. So if you're worried about toxicity. So I was wondering if you were gonna be able to see this little piece dissolve. And I'm thinking the answer is with this stir going, probably not. I'd like it to be vigorous. You know, I'm gonna slow the stir down a little bit here. See, we still have alum in there. There's cut one little chunk in there, but mostly dissolved. I'm just gonna keep it going. And we're gonna throw this in. Oh, <laughs> this is a magnetic stir. And now I've got the piece stuck on the outside of the magnetic stir. That's not exactly what I wanted, is it? I 
I think those bubbles there are indicative of hydrogen. Oh, they could be air bubbles, you know, being captured, but it looks like they're getting bigger. So I think that's hydrogen being formed, which means it's reacting. Uh, my guess. By the way, I have much more alum than it required to dissolve this. So at this temperature, well, so it's four and a half grams of alum per gram, and this part weighs less than a gram. So I need less than four grams, and I've got 65 in there. So that should tell you that uh, this thing should react pretty quickly. One thing that would improve uh, the, the solution contact, since the, we're using an ionic solution to dissolve uh, metal, is that you want the part to be grease free. Now, obviously when you're cutting a tap, you almost always use some sort of cutting fluid. So I would recommend spraying alcohol into the, into the cutting area as much as you can, if you can, to try and remove some of that grease. That'll increase the surface area the solution can come in contact with and speed it up. So we're going here and we'll see how long this takes to dissolve. Hopefully it's not that long. I'm seeing bits fall off and go into solution pretty quickly. Remember I said the lowest temperature this hot plate would go to is 150 C? Well, apparently with the water evaporating off it, uh, it's cooling off enough that, that I'm almost on 110 on the real stat here, 120 on the real stat. I'm at 95. So it really can't hold it at 150 with a load on it. Uh, the water evaporating is considered a thermal load. So uh, you got to take that into compensation or, or you have to take that into consideration. Another thing is that you could find yourself a hot plate that has a temperature sensor with feedback so that it holds the temperature pretty consistent. This one does not. This is a fairly slow process on a relative basis, so don't plan on doing it if you need it in a hurry. Obviously, you have to look for other solutions. A really fast one would be a sink or EDM if you've got it. <laughs> Most of us don't. You can see the uh, train of bubbles coming right off this guy. The reaction's going on pretty good right now. Even though the temperature was much lower, we're still only at 130, so I'm kind of curious where. I keep inching up the temperature to see if I can get this to about 150 Fahrenheit. That's what I'm looking for. Here we are an hour later, and you can see the reaction's really moving now. Finally got up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. You could even go hotter, and that would probably even be better. I didn't want to boil. This is four hours later and the part is almost 100% dissolved. All right, so the first one ran four hours and it dissolved all of it, but one tiny little piece. Uh, so I'm gonna try something even much harder. So we have 300 milliliters of water here and I've added to that 180 milligram, uh, grams of potassium alum and just going to let it dissolve. I preheated the water in the microwave. I used reverse osmosis water so I wouldn't have any complications from minerals in my tap water. I don't know what the temperature of my water is. Let's see. Look at that. Right on 150. What do you know? Okay. So we're going to let that dissolve. And then I'm going to do a harder scenario than I did last time, which I'm going to break a tap off in a piece of aluminum and see how long that takes. By the way, in four hours, it only dissolved three quarters of the tap. I thought it dissolved the whole thing, but when I took the magnetic uh, mixing bit out, uh, it had a little bit of the tap still attached to it. Um, I lost that in the drain when I was cleaning it out because I didn't realize until it was done. It was a very small piece, but in any case, it, there was still some left. So that was not ideal. Oopsies, there you go. Broken tap. So this one's gonna be much harder. So I got a big chunk of tap sticking out of there. I do have a hole going all the way through, which is a little bit of an advantage for this. Blind hole would be even harder still. Uh, last time it took four hours to get just a piece of this tap that was floating free. 
So I suspect this is going to take even longer, but we're going to set it up and uh, see how it goes. So I have the spinner rotating on one far side. That way I can get a current flow in this direction. Then what I'm going to try and do is to set this guy in here. So the current is forced to go right by the part here that is going to be that I want to be disintegrated. So that's my setup. Put a cover glass on it. I think I could use some additional light here because the uh, dish I put on top blocks the light. All right, so you can see that uh, the bubbles have started. And that the reaction is occurring is just a fairly slow reaction, even at these moderate temperatures I've got it going at. Now we move on to the reaction going on in a time lapse for almost 20 hours. And as you can see, it's vigorous, but we start losing water because it gets used up in the reaction and some evaporates, which collects on the side of the container. So now you start getting particles of potassium alum in solution because it's so concentrated and that obscures view, unfortunately. I end up adding water for the last bit to make it a little bit clearer and you'll see it change right here. It's fewer particles in there, but still hard to see what actually happened. All right, so after 20 hours, it's not completely dissolved. Uh, kept the solution hot. We're gonna turn this off. However, the solution itself has become fairly acidic. I thought the potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, uh, was gonna be the dominant ion in solution. It turns out that that is not the case, that uh, the sulfate ions and the hydrogen gas are forming, well, uh, sulfuric acid in there which is a fairly strong base. And if that, you know, we could find out how true that is uh, just by putting a piece of pH paper in there. So there we are, it's currently sitting at uh, neutral, roughly, actually it looks like it's slightly acidic. Let's just dip it in there. Pretty instantaneous, look at that, pH of two. So smaller numbers are acidic, larger numbers are basic, seven is neutral, we're sitting right down at a pH of two. So that's a fairly acidic solution. That's one drawback right there. Uh, let me go get a pair of gloves on and remove the part out of here. You'll see there's also some staining on the aluminum, not desirable either. Although this may be a way to uh, do the equivalent of blackening on aluminum in the future. I'm not sure, we'll have to check that one out. All right, so I got my safety glasses on. That water is pretty hot and uh, interesting. Oh, that, oh, this is, yeah, this is pretty warm. You can see that there's still tap in there. So let me, uh, I think the black stuff on here is iron uh, sulfate. All right, so 18 hours and it did not dissolve the entire tap. It did dissolve it quite a bit. It is significantly reduced in there and now it's loose. There we go. Here's salt that's left of the tap came right out. So that was a big chunk of tap, which is now completely gone. So it worked on getting the tap out of the hole but that was 18 hours. Now, one of the other byproducts of this reaction is potassium hydroxide. And interestingly enough, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide attack aluminum. And this was shiny aluminum before, and it's got a really cool matte finish on it. Let me go rinse this off again, because the uh, ferric sul iron sulfate from the little tap part here, this, it's black on black, but you can always see it. Uh, the little tap part that's left is getting all over this, because that's the iron sulfate part. So let me remove this guy off of here and clean this up and I'll show you the finish. This might be a good way to get a really cool finish on aluminum, but you know, this is kind of the bass backwards way to do it. Uh, a quicker way to do it would just be to use a solution of sodium hydroxide and water and you can get a similar finish. I work for a company that uh, finished all their aluminum this way and it made a very nice even finish on it. It etches the aluminum and it's very pretty. I'll be right back. So here's the finish. It's actually very pretty. There's iron sulfate still on it. Left, It's stained it a little bit in a couple spots. Uh, to give you a comparison, I'm going to take this over the Scotch-Brite wheel so you can see what shiny aluminum, which this was all very shiny aluminum, this whole section right here when we started. Uh, I'll be right back and I'll show you what shiny aluminum looks next to this, uh, this uh, etched finish, which I think is really pretty actually. I think it's very nice, very white. For a contrast, you can see the shiny aluminum next to the 
etched aluminum. It's very pretty. So that's another finishing opportunity or possibility uh, for people who don't want to anodize or allodyne. Uh, you can use a sodium hydroxide solution or potassium hydroxide solution and etch your aluminum. And the smoother it is when you start, the more even the finish is when you're done. Obviously there's some blemishes because this wasn't perfect, but you can see the difference. I think that's very pretty. I kind of like that. Now, proven that this is an acid, well, another way to tell is to throw in some baking soda and see how it reacts to neutralize the acid. And there you go. So that's basically a reaction between sulfuric acid and sodium bicarbonate, which is gonna produce CO2 and then sodium sulfide, I guess. So I'm just neutralizing this acid. And to prove it, we were a pH of two. And now we're at a pH of three. So that's 10 times less acidic than it was. It obviously needs a whole bunch more baking soda to completely neutralize that, but we're gonna let that go. So the final assessment is, does potassium alum, does it work to remove taps that are broken off? The answer is a qualified yes. So if the tap was an exposed hole all the way through like this one, it took 18 hours to dissolve about a quarter inch of tap out of the center of that. So not an insignificant amount, and the threads are all looking perfect in there. You do get some, a nice finish. There is some etching done on the aluminum itself, uh, which I think is very attractive, but you gotta want that. Otherwise, you're gonna need to uh, do some additional finishing on your part. Now, if you can't afford your parts too big to submerge, like you're doing something big, you'd have to come up with a whole nother solution to get hot alum solution across your, uh, across your part. Uh, I'll show an option in just a second. Another thing is to remember is that this forms a fairly acidic complex and being acidic, you know, you gotta wear protective gloves, you gotta wear eye protection. It's forming sulfuric acid, fairly strong acid, so uh, be careful there. Uh, let me just move on real quick to show you a solution that you could use if you wanted to uh, get a bigger part that you couldn't submerge in a container. And if you do have a really big container, you're gonna need a lot of alum. I used almost this whole container in this last, about half of the container in just this last batch because 300 milliliters of water takes like 180 grams. And this is only 500 gram, uh, 454 grams. So it's just under half uh, of all the alum in there. If you're looking for another solution, as I was mentioning earlier, where the part's too big, you could build a clay dam on the part and then you could use something like this, which is a peristaltic pump. So a peristaltic pump works, let's see if I can remember how to open this, okay, like this. You take a piece of flexible silicone hose, you run it through here, and it takes a roller and it pinches it off and then pushes through, which creates a seal in the hose and then draws a vacuum on one side and pushes liquid through on another side. So a peristaltic pump, the beauty is, as long as the material that you're squeezing and pressing through is not subject to uh, attack by, by the chemicals you're using, like I couldn't use a regular pump because if the impeller was iron in any way, obviously it would dissolve, so that wouldn't work. So a peristaltic pump like this one would work to pump, and what I could do is I could suck hot water out through the pump here. You're limited to 150 Fahrenheit with this particular pump, and pump that solution right at the target and then have the target, uh, have the solution drain down back into the sump. So that's all the possibility. Use some uh, glass uh, like pie pans or uh, pie plates or, or like casserole plates and the glass won't be attacked by the alum solution or the acid and you can go ahead and do it. But again, you got to worry a little bit about etching. So the end, so the, my end take on this whole thing is does this work? Yes, it does. It actually works reasonably well, but it takes a lot of time. So to dissolve the little piece, it didn't dissolve the entire little piece in four hours. That was just free in the solution. And the case of uh, this guy where I broke a tap off in threads with the through hole and had the solution basically just running straight in one side and maybe a little bit leaked through the edge of the tap, but most of it went around. Uh, that took 18 hours. Uh, 18 hours? Yeah, 18 hours or so to, to dissolve. Uh, not the whole piece, but I could just pull it out because it made it very loose at that point. So that's my intake. Hope this was useful. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.